CFE in Port, if I can say, is the most important aspect of data migration as well as any type of data, bulk data entry that you would like to do within NetSuite. Um, any of you guys, if you have been in, involved with NetSuite implementations, this is one of the you know uh, crucial things that comes uh, along your way. And they are pitfalls. They, it's not straightforward. Although the, the topic itself it, it, it is, you can create an Excel file, save it as CSV, and import it in. But there are a few things that you guys need to make sure you understand. So the agenda today is going to include the overview for the CSV import. I'm going to walk you through an import assistant that it's like a wizard goes take you step by step of you know what needs to be imported, what you can configure, what's the mapping like between the CSV columns and NetSuite. And um, we're going to look through some of the errors you might get along the way. And finally, if you're interested and if uh, you have done some developing or suite scripts, how to invoke a CSV import through a suite script. Okay, so let's get started. So as I was mentioning, um, it's the most commonly used method for transferring data into NetSuite. And you can do bulk updates and inserts, and you could pretty much update any type of data, any type of records that you want. There are some limitations, but it's, it's very minimal. The CSV import assistant that's available to you walks you through the import mapping and configuration, and you can access it through import export option under setup. Let me actually go into NetSuite so I can watch, walk you guys through it. So if you go under setup, import export, import CSV record, the this opens up our import assistant. Okay, and I'll come back to this screen. Now, when you create these CSV import mappings, you can save them. So you, they could be used later on, or you can then reference them within a suite script. The import assistant keep, takes you through step-by-step, step, um, starting from the import type you're doing to the selecting the files, and hold on, this poll keeps popping up here. So selecting the CSV import file, setting the options, doing the field mapping, and finally saving or executing or, or doing both to that CSV mapping. On the import assistant, the first thing you would set is the import type, okay? And then based on the import type, the record types. So let me get back in here. In the import type, there are quite a few options that are available to you, okay? I have a list of these included in uh, my slide deck as well. Once you select the import type and the record type, uh, then you can select the files to upload. These files would show up down here. If you are uploading multiple files, you would start with the primary file and then provide the link file. And I'll, I'll walk you through that as well. In terms of the import types, so you have accounting, activities, classification, communication, custom records, customization, employees, items, relationships, rules, subscription billing, supply chain support, transactions, and website import. Now, once you select each any one of those import types, then you get to pick the record type. The record types uh, are different based on the import type and that list, uh, actually I have that available here as well. This is a publicly accessible URL. I have included that here in my slide. You can access it from the web. And this is a good list of different types of records that are available to you and not just if they're available in, for CSV import, but also if those records are available for scripting, for accessing from outside of NetSuite using web services, for Suite and Let It Connect, which is really a direct ODPC connection 
two net three tables if you guys want to get read only access you can use Suite analytics connect and uh it's quite a quite a few of these uh record types that are available based on the category you pick so you know that's why i didn't want to go through it i just want to show you that it's available okay so um let's get started one uh, what i'm going to do is go back into my netsuite instance for the import type i am going to pick transactions and for record type i'm going to pick vendor payment so now down below first of all character encoding you should leave it to western uh, unless you are uh, using Chinese or other uh, characters in your text or descriptions. So, you know, that might affect the encoding, but most of the cases, you know, Western Windows 1252 works. On the file side, or on the, sorry, on the comma delimiter for CSV, comma is the standard, although you have different options available. Then for the files, you can select one files to import. So in this case, you know, I could do, if I'm importing a vendor payment, I can just import vendor payment and just create those vendor payments without applying them to bills. But if I want to apply vendor payments to bills, I would have to create, I have to pick vendor payment file, which is my primary file. And then on top of that, I have to pick the bills file that I would like to apply the, that payments to. So let me show you what I have worked out here for this walkthrough. So I have two bills that I've created, both are for the same vendor. One bill is for $20, okay? The second vendor bill is for $40. Now the payment file and the bill file that I have set up, I actually have it here in my notepad. So I have kept it very simple. So let me start with the payment file. This is the CSV file. I'm just not showing you inside Excel. I'm just showing you within the text editor so you guys can, can see, you know, more delimiters and other uh, values, characters. So I have a reference number. I'm going to come back and tell you what that is. Vendor ID, payment date, bank account, subsidiary, and currency. And you can see it's there's one line because I'm just going to create one payment. That one payment gets applied to two different vendor bills. So for that, I am referencing the same reference number as my payment. So it's really tying my vendor bills to that one payment, okay? And then I have my vendor ID, although it's not required, I just have it here. And most importantly, invoice ID and the payment amount, okay? And these are all internal IDs. You can use external IDs. You can use names. I'm just for simplicity, simplicity's sake, I'm using internal ID here. Okay. Uh, let's see. Craig, are there any questions? Do you want me to take on some questions or keep on going? You did have a question about the format of the import files. Um, I guess that's talking about kind of the columns and you know what type of information in that CSV are you importing? So um, it's actually up to you guys, whatever uh, data you have available, because the mapping allows you to map the columns from the CSV to the fields in NetSuite. So um, you have a lot of freedom there. Although if you guys want to have standard formats, and I'll share that with you as well later on, I have some templates available for you guys. And this is a, you know, huge, we, we use these uh, in data migration. So I have quite a few templates here. Let me just quickly show you what a template looks like. So it just shows you the different columns that are available, the types of the data, data that can go in there, some sample data down below. Um, also has field restrictions, which fields are required, which are not, uh, character limits and so on. So this information comes obviously quite handy when you're uh, doing data import first time in NetSuite or 
you know, subsequently later on as well. So I'll share this with the, you know, with everybody that's attending today. Okay, and I have quite a few of these starting from, you know, bank entity details, which is more for the, you know, the new sweet payment suite, um, you know, uh, the new bank information settings that are available for vendors and customers. Um, class, chart of account, contacts, employees, journal entries, POs, credit memos, you know, so I have quite a few uh, templates available. Okay, so let's come back to, to our import here. So I have picked my primary file. I have picked my billing, my bills that that payment would get applied to. So let's just hit next. So next up, I have import options. In these import options, so you have add, update, add or update. So let me come back to my, and I'll come back to this linked file because I have a few more points there. So add option is there if you just want to insert new records. Update option is there if you are only more, only updating existing records within NetSuite. If you don't, you are not sure your list or your rows in the CSV file might exist or might not exist, pick the add or update option because it will do both for you, okay? Now, there are some advanced options below. So if I expand this, and this would be different based on which features are enabled and which version of NetSuite you are using, okay? So some of them are self-explanatory, like a CSV decimal delimiter. It's there because, you know, sometime it could be a comma. Uh, believe me, or you know, they are uh, the regions where instead of period, they use comma or decimal. Um, log system notes, custom fields, override missing fields. Again, self-explanatory. You can validate mandatory custom fields, uh, so it would import would check if the custom field that are set as required. So when you create custom field, you can, and you add it to a form, you can mark it as required. And this import option would make sure that all the custom fields are either mapped or have a default value when you're bringing new data in, okay? There's override sublist option. I'm gonna go over that. It has a few things uh, that I wanna touch upon. You can choose to ignore read-only fields. Um, and also if there's a multi-select field, you can have multi, you know, different values or multiple values in the CSV, just delimited by pipe or you know, whichever character you wanna choose, you can fill in there. You can also have a custom form. So whichever form you want to pick, you can pick. So whenever the, if it's an entity or a transaction that gets created within NetSuite, it would use this form as the default, okay? And then uh, finally, run server suite script or trigger, or trigger workflows. This option, I, I keep it enabled, but there are times I have unchecked it because it can affect throttling as well as performance and you can get um, timeout errors or usage limit exceeded errors. And I'll, I'll talk about that in a second. So first, um, the missing fields. If you leave any CSV field empty, meaning they are mapped, but they don't have any data, that does not mean NetSuite is gonna clear that field, okay? It just won't update that, so keep that in mind. For sublists, sublists are related records. For a, you know, an easiest example is if you're creating a, a sales order, any of the line items are really part of the item sublist. Or if you're creating a customer, any of the addresses, because there could be multiple addresses, are part of the address sublist, right? 
So um, you can set some of these options through CSV import preferences, which is, by the way, available under setup, import, export, and CSV import preference. And I'll quickly show you that. Okay. So these options are available to you. If override sublist is enabled, then the CSV file sublist rows completely replace existing sublist data. If there's, that means if you are updating an existing NetSuite transaction record and you're referencing a specific sublist within that transaction, all the data gets over it. Okay. If it's disabled, then it has a different behavior based on if it's a keyed sublist, meaning there is uh, a primary key or other sublist where the key is not important. Okay, for keys, keyed sublist, it only selectively updates the sublist. For other sublists, it just appends at the end. Okay, and by the way, there's no way to delete sublist data. You can either update it or you can append to it. There's an option that I don't have enabled on my instance here, which is to prevent duplicate records. So as you import the CSV uh, data, you can check, actually not you, but NetSuite will check for you if there are duplicate records. And it can block import of the duplicates, okay? Hussein, we actually have a couple of questions uh, in the Q&A. Um, the first one going back one step is, could you give an example of what you were just talking about? of the sublist, yes. Yeah, so um, sublist is what actually I have here. So in my payments, this bills that the payment is getting applied to, this is part of a sublist, okay? And when the payment gets created, I'll show you. If I am updating an existing uh, payment, then any entries in this sublist would overwrite everything that's currently there. If I enable this overwrite sublist, or if I check that box, okay? If it's disabled or if I uncheck it, then only the ones where the, if they key sublist, which for the bills it is when you apply the bills, it is a key sublist and it is only going to update the ones that are key that where the key matches for a, a non key sublist it would just append the entries to the end of that sublist so um, maybe an example would be worthwhile here let me just open up an existing payment so you guys can see what that means. Uh, let's, let's look at this one. So down here, it, this is a vendor payment that's applied to one of the bills. So this vendor bills is a sublist. Although there's just one row in this, but you know, if that payment was applied to multiple vendor bills, you would see that many entries here. And this is a key sublist. So whenever you're updating uh, this vendor payment, if, and let me go back to my import assistant, if this option is checked, then it'll clear out all the applied payments and just do a new application from scratch. If it is unchecked, then it would just go and update the keyed entries because this is a keyed sublist. It would only go where the update this bill if the key matches. Okay. Excellent, excellent. So going back a couple of minutes, um, you were showing us some templates uh, for import. And there was yes. a question from Linda. Is there uh, a, an advanced journal entry template? Good question. Advanced journal entry template. Um, 
not in this list, but I can get you an advanced journal entry template. Um, it's a little bit off topic, but I can I can tell you because it, that has come up before. Um, in the advanced journal entry template, or sorry, in the advanced journal entry screen or option, there is an import. Keep in mind, as I was mentioning earlier, there's certain transactions or certain types of data that are available for import outside of the CSV import. And so journal entries or intercompany journal entries are one that are available outside of CSV import and you can do it from here. Budgets is, is another that you can import outside of the CSV and do an import from here. But what I was gonna mention to you is if you come to the advanced intercompany journal entry, you would see that it would provide you a sample. And I can just open an Excel here for you guys to see. This is not as elaborate as I was, uh, the other example I was showing you, let me open that. Uh, but at least it gives you the columns. Right, so you guys can see this is, you know, it has more detail that, uh, you know, it talks about column by column, what information is available and what's needed. So Craig, does that answer the question? Yeah, I think, uh, I think that's great. Uh, let's press forward. Okay, wonderful. So we talked about preventing the duplicate records and that option could be turned on and CSV import can kick back duplicate transactions. So they won't be imported, okay? But you have to turn it on. It's uh, so this duplicate detection merge feature has to be enabled for this. So next uh, two options, which actually I don't think I have enabled on my session as well is for multi-threading and for queuing. This is only available if you have the Sweet Cloud Plus license. By default, whenever you're doing a CSV import or any import job, it runs on a single thread sequentially. So one import will run and then whatever uh, is next would run after that. But that could slow down because if you're importing a lot of data, you know, um, and maybe for data migration is not a big deal. Data migration you're doing before go live, you have more time, you can bring the data slowly or you know, uh, maybe uh, in a couple of tries. But if you're doing imports on regular basis, the performance could be an issue or import could backlog. In that case, you could use multi-threading. So there are two options there. First of all, from multi-threading, if you your data imports are have a lot of rows, you can use multiple threads to import those in. This is different than queues. You can keep in mind, this is running the same import file, dividing it up on multiple threads and trying to bring that data in, you know, just in a distributed, in a parallel fashion. One thing you also have to keep in mind, if you have Sweet Cloud Plus and multi, threading is turned on, the sequence is not guaranteed. So you might have payments, for example, listed from start, uh, first payment, second payment, you might have sequenced it by date, but that's not how they will get created. Multi-threading, you know, has a life of its own. It would create whichever payment, you know, it gets to and whenever it gets to it. In contrast to multi-threading, there's also queuing that's available. So the, what queues allows you to do is to schedule or is to run CSV import on a different queue. So you can, for example, run five CSV import in parallel, one on each queue and each queue operate on its own. One comment that I'll make is if you guys are on, are on a single uh, NetSuite uh, queuing instance and you're migrating to Suite Cloud Plus, 
everything by default there's going to be on Q1, but you can always go and you can update that setting. I have a screenshot here, so I'm going to zoom in so I can show you what that means. So if you have Sweet Cloud Plus, you would get under this uh, multi-select value delimiter, you would get two more options, multi-threading and queue number. So you can check multi-threading if you want to enable that, and you can decide which queue you want to save your CSV import or if you want to run your CSV import from. Okay. So now let's come to field mapping. Um, are there any other questions? Uh, yeah, ask? so before we move on to the field mapping, which is probably a lot of the meat and potatoes here of, of this talk, um, Shai asks about you know, the differences between all of the different NetSuite deployments out there, right? No, NetSuite's customized for everybody. There's no one right way to live, right? Um, so since every NetSuite instance is slightly different based on industry or custom fields created, is there a way to generate a CSV template for a specific form based on his actual instance? Yeah, so you, CSV template is, is within your controls. You can set up CSV template to however you want. And based on that template, you can save that mapping. So you can always just you, and actually I'm doing that here too. I'll show you in a second. Uh, maybe it's a good segue into that. So um, on the import assistant, I was, I started from scratch, right? So if I go next, actually, this is another, let me talk about this because this is important and then I'll come to that question. So since I have multiple files, it's asking me what field am I using to relate the primary file to my linked file? And if you guys remember, I had the reference field. In this case, reference field one, that same for these two different vendor bills. And it maps to this vendor payment that I am going to generate, okay? So that's why I'm using my ref number field here to link my primary file to my application file, bill application file. This could be your payment ID. If you want to provide your own payment ID and not auto-generated, you can provide it there, or this could also be an external ID, okay? Now, Coming to the mapping, there are few things that you need to know. First of all, the CSV file fields are on the left. NetSuite fields are on the right. Some of the fields you can see got automatically mapped and that's because the column names were the same. The NetSuite picked them up and it matches them and maps them. Okay, for each of these mappings, the easiest way to do this is you go click on the row and then you go pick which of the, for example, on the payee side, the payee is my vendor. So I go map that payee to my vendor and this gets filled in, right? Um, this bill, is my invoice, which is actually coming from my application file. So I'm gonna open that up and I'm gonna map, map it to the invoice, right? The date, it defaults into today's date, but I would like to map it to payment date. So I will do that. Another thing you need to keep in mind that you can, there are different ways to match up the values. And this is where a lot of times people have errors. In the case of vendors, if my CSV file has vendor name, then I'm gonna leave it as names. But if my CSV file has internal ID, which is a numeric value or an external ID, then I should pick that appropriate reference type. Otherwise, the CSV import is going to fail. And I would do that for all of these, okay? 
Now, coming back to that question about the templates. So the easiest way is if you want, you can create your own template similar to this, which maps to the form, all the fields that you wanna bring in for your form. Then you have to go through the CSV import. And once you go to the end, you can save it. You don't need to run it, you can save it. And when you save it, it would show up under import export saved CSV imports. So all the mapping, for example, what I did, it's here for me. I can also view the field map. If I click on it, it, would, it shows me the map, the CSV versus NetSuite fields. I can also click on this and it takes me to the import assistant. Import type record type is already filled in. All I need to do is select my primary file, select my bills application file, then go next. Everything else is already picked up from the saved configuration. So I just hit next. Reference number is already set up as the link field and my mapping is there, right? So, let me just quickly run through this so I can show you guys what the import would do. So I'm gonna, so here I have a couple of options. I have save, I have run, I have save as and save as and run. Save is gonna always overwrite an existing import. If it's the first time, then it'll just save it. Otherwise it will overwrite an existing import with that name. Run would run the import without saving it. Save as would make a copy with a new name and save as and run would make a copy and execute at the same time. So at this time, I'm just gonna do save and run. It's like I said, it asks you, do you wanna override the saved import? I say yes. So the next screen is, is still the import assistant, but it gives you a little confirmation at the top. And from that confirmation, you can go to the import job status. And here you can see two, three, five. Yep. So this is the one that just ran one record imported. I can now go to my bill payment list and I should see my payment up at the top. And if I could click on view, it should, yeah. So it has payment applied to two different bills, one for $20, one for $40. That payment amount is the same, $10. Okay. So I was able to apply to go from two payment and payment application files and generate that payment that applies to two different vendor invoices. Okay. Let's see, any questions? Let's break for questions. Uh, hopefully Shay. Yeah, so there's a follow-up from Shai, um, how to create and save the mapping. The original question was about generating the CSV template for uh, itself. Um, a file with all the NetSuite fields listed on the right side of the mapping screen or pick up an entity example items and get a CSV with all the column headings of an item record field. It, it sounds to me he's, he's asking like, can, can I export my fields and use that as a template? I'm not 100% uh, understanding the question here. Um, Shai, maybe we'll reach out and, and touch base with you on this. Actually, particular I think question. I might know the question. So, gotcha. so there's a, there are two things that helps me along the way. Uh, first of all, if I want to look at the list of fields that are available, you can always go on the CSV, on the CSV import mapping and look at the fields that are available. But there is also a schema browser. So on the schema browser, for example, I can come and look at, you know, uh, where is my vendor payment? Vendor payment, and it would show me all the different fields that are available and I can pick and choose which fields I wanna bring in. Okay, so that's one option. Um, 
There's also a hack that uh, you can do. Um, and that is for any type of trans, any type of screen within NetSuite, at the end of the URL, if you put ampersand XML equals to true or equals to T, it would give you an XML dump of all the fields that are available on that form. Okay, so that comes in handy as well. And this includes hidden field also, which you won't see on the form. Okay. So that's really cool. Can you just repeat that, uh, that string at the end? Yeah. So at the end, you have to type ampersand XML equals to T and it would just render a full XML string for, and it works for any type of uh, entity you have at the Netflix. So for example, I can go to a vendor bill and do the same. Previously I was doing it on the vendor payment, you know, but I can also do it uh, on the vendor bill. I can do it on the vendor. Wherever I am, I can do this. Okay. And by the way, these are where you see the list. You, this is usually the sub list that I am mentioning or I'm talking about. Okay. Okay. Uh, let's see what else I have. So we talked about field mapping. Um, we talked how CSV fields are on the left, NSV fields are on the right. If there are any required fields, they would be listed. They would be pre-filled on the mapping, okay? So you must map those required fields first because without mapping the required fields, you're gonna run into issues. Now you're, you know, your import is gonna fail and you might not have a good error to go by, okay? So with the CSV field mapping, like I said, map the required fields first. I think you NetSuite won't even let you go to the next screen until your required fields are mapped. Uh, make sure your reference type is selected and, and mapped correctly between all the link files and the primary files. You can also set default values. So you can set default values for each of the fields you can either map it to a CSV or you can just provide a value during the field mapping, okay? And then you can also set null values. For NetSuite One World, if you're importing any of these record type, including chart of accounts, contact, customers, employees, jobs, which are projects, leads, partners, prospects, or vendors, you have to provide the subsidiary. For other uh, import types, a record type subsidiary is not required because it gets inferred from one of these entities. Um, Sublist fields are at the bottom. So let me actually go back and show you that quickly. So let me go back to the import assistant here. Uh, let me pick my primary in my build. My linked reference number and now the field. So with sub list shows up at the bottom right here. Okay. And this is, you know, if you have more than one, you can always do an add on this. Otherwise, you would be just mapping the sublist to the fields from the other file that you have. And this is how I'm able to say this vendor payment 
that's getting created, it gets applied to the vendor bills in this sublist. Okay. The address is there because I can have multiple vendor addresses and I can include that. If there are multiple sublists uh, that are available, you would have this little add symbol. This add right here that would show up. Okay. Save and starting the import. We already talked about it. The only thing I'm going to mention is a script ID. Uh, you can provide a custom script ID that can come in handy if you want to call this import from SweetScript. Okay. And actually, that's what I would like to show you next. And I think that would be the last topic. And then I'll open it up for questions. So for SweetScript, um, let me just see if I can make it easier for anybody that for a lot of you folks that are uh, not developers. So what I am going to do is the same import files that I use uh, import assistant for, I have uploaded them to an AP folder on my file cabinet. Okay, so file cabinet, you can access from documents, files, file cabinet. And this is where my payment and payment application file, file is uploaded to. Now, I have a sweet script. Let me close all this. This sweet script, you know, it might be that fine font might be too small for you guys. So let me show it, show you here. So that sweet script is all it's doing is taking the application and the payment file and using those files, it's creating a, a task. A task is of CSV import and it references the mapping ID. So that mapping ID could be a numeric ID, internal ID, or it could be the script ID that you set up when you save that, that um, CSV map. Okay, let me show you where I got that ID from. So when I go to setup, I go to import export, save CSV import, and this is the ID right here. That file I showed you is an older file, but the ID here is 183. So if I go back to my, my script, and if I can edit this, uh, there are other function in here as well, so I'm going to skip those. But let me bring you to the import here. So right there, the mapping ID is 183. The file path is AP, and that's where these two files are. Okay. So let me run through this script. So all I'm going to do is now go to the deployment. You can set this up as schedule. So a lot of time it comes in handy if you have files coming in from outside of NetSuite or even people are uploading files to the file cabinet and you want an, a scheduled service that can go look up those files and import the data in, okay? So this script assumes the file sitting in that AP folder. And all I'm gonna do is click on save and save and execute. So that's that's a little trick you can do. If it's a scheduled script, you can execute it on demand. You don't have to wait for the scheduled interval. It can just run on demand. So this got completed. Now, interesting enough, if I go and look at my CSV import status, it shows up right here. And it says one record imported. And if I go here under my vendor bills, my vendor payments, now I should have two payments. 
This payment I brought in through manual import, and this payment was brought in through the suite script import. And both utilize the same import mapping. And that's the beauty of it. You can create mapping, you can keep it, all the information in one place, and then you can, you know, you have a choice. You can import it manually when you want, or you can run a script and the script can trigger it. Okay. Uh, let's see, what else do I have? Uh, we covered that. Canceling CSE import, the only um, caveat there is if it's pending, it would cancel. No problem. If it's processing, it can only cancel the records that it hasn't imported yet. And when you get your notification, it will tell you which records have been imported and which ones were not. Okay. Um, let me also show you what an error, what uh, import completion looks like. So in this case, this email notification was generated from that CSV import. And it just tells you what ran, how many records were imported. If it failed, it would have told you which one failed or which one were canceled. And this email gets generated regardless whether the import was done through a script or it was done manually. 